Okay, uh, hello to everyone. Thanks for being here. Today, we're very happy to have Lagoji Ovlak, who is going to tell us about flat jetty gravity and the Schwarzian of BMS2. Lagoji, take it away. Thanks, thanks, Felipe, for the introduction, and thank you, everyone, for uh, inviting me and giving me the chance to speak here. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to, uh, to speak here on Zoom, but as I was telling Felipe earlier, it's really nice to, to have the opportunity to sort of speak despite the huge time difference between our two regions. So, you know, Zoom does have its advantages. So, as announced, I'm going to talk about uh, some recent work, uh, which I posted here in the archive with Hamid Afshar, um, on two-dimensional gravity, Jakiv Teilbom gravity in flat space, and its relation to uh, the Schwarzian action of a group that's commonly called BMS in two dimensions. So um, actually, before I say anything else, of course, this is a Zoom talk. So if there's a technical issue at some point, if you don't see me, don't hear me, if you don't see the pointer, please let me know, because of course, I cannot judge from here. Um, and so, okay, let me now start by introducing the subject. Um, in particular, let me sort of motivate it broadly. And as you probably know, the motivation comes from uh, the quest for quantum gravity. We want to try to quantize gravity in a certain way. And the most useful guide we've had in, in recent decades has been the ADS-CFT correspondence. So if you adopt a sort of naive dimension counting perspective, you would imagine that the simplest case is that of a two-dimensional ADS bulk, which would then be dual to sort of a one-dimensional theory. Of course, there's no such thing as a one-dimensional CFT. So what's normally done is something like a correspondence between ADS2 and really a Schwarzen theory in 1D, which you can think of as an inferred limit of the SYK model. This, as you probably know, has been you know, uh, very prominent in the literature in recent years. I should mention also that even if you don't necessarily care uh, well about a 2D bulk per se, you might care about extremal black holes and their entropy. And in that case, you have to also deal with uh, an ADS2 throat in, any, in every case. So um, one of the prominent aspects of this ADS2 to Schwarzian correspondence is the fact that this is closely related to a uh, Virazoro group theory, and, and in particular to the quadrant orbits of Virazoro, in the sense that if you have a good control over the group theory, um, well, there's a lot of things you can do just by a good understanding of geometry. In particular, for example, the fact that the partition function localizes, which was understood in this paper back in 2017, uh, is really just a consequence of the doistermatt heckman formula applied to quadrant orbits in this very specific case of the Virazor group. So there's really sort of deep results you can get just by understanding the group at the heart of all this, all this story. Now, if you sort of take uh, perhaps a naive perspective and hope that the notion of holography works on quantum gravity beyond ADS, that you don't necessarily have to have an ADS bulk, well, you might hope that holography also works in flat space. And in that case, in fact, in dimensions three and higher, um, there has been some progress made in recent years on that front, mostly thanks to the asymptotic symmetry of those space times, which is called the Bondi Metzner Sachs asymptotic symmetry, after the name of the guys who discovered this actually back in the 60s. So, in the same way, uh, so this is called the BMS symmetry for, you know, it's a shorthand terminology. And so, in the same way, uh, two-dimensional bulks have an asymptotic symmetry, which has come to be known as a BMS2 symmetry. And then you might hope that controlling this BMS2 symmetry in the same way that you can control the Vera Zero group in ADS, uh, well, gives you a handle on the theory. So, for example, you might hope that uh, the action for flat JT, so for Minkowski and JT gravity, actually equals some notion of BMS Schwarzian, and as a result that you can somehow compute the corresponding partition function. Today's talk is going to be precisely about these questions. So I'm going to define a notion of BMS group. I'm going to see uh, how it's related to the flat JT action functional. And I'm going to talk about the corresponding partition function. So before I actually jump into some uh, details, let me just give you a brief, not quite an overview of, the overview of the talk, but really sort of the main slogans I'm going to, to make. Throughout the talk, I'm going to consider a two-dimensional space-time at some finite temperature so that uh, time is going to be Euclidean and labeled by this angular coordinate phi. So you should really think of space time as this sort of cylinder where I have a bulk which is two dimensional with a Euclidean time that is sort of along a circle and a space direction that runs horizontally here. And then I'm going to describe most of what's happening here on one of the boundaries of space time. By the way, I'm going to really deal with just one boundary. I'm not going to address the fact that there may, there may be a second boundary 
in another asymptotic region, I'm going to deal with just one boundary. Then in this language, the BMS group we're going to find is going to have a characteristic semi-direct product structure where the non-abelian factor is going to be uh, a diffeomorphism group of this time-like circle here. And the abelian factor is going to consist of what I'm calling bulk translations, meaning translations that sort of pull the circle back into the bulk as so they're sort of radial, if you, if you will, uh, as we're going to see. Most importantly, the corresponding currents, as you will see, are going to consist of what you would call a CFT stress tensor and the function on the circle. I'm going to return to this later, but in particular then in trying to express the two-dimensional bulk Jacquive Teitelbaum theory as a 1D boundary theory, you know, we will see that the corresponding BMS Schwarzian, so the one of the ingredients of this 1D boundary theory, the Schwarzian will in fact be the zero mode of this particular stress tensor, of the dual of these diffeomorphisms, which is again the standard situation in ADS2, but it will also turn out to be the case uh, here in, in flat space. And so in particular, similarly to the correspondence between ADS and the Schwarzian, we're going to find in the end a one loop exact uh, partition function. However, I'm going to argue that despite this sort of similarity, um, well, I, I, I haven't quite, quite found a very good scientific way to put it, but the group is weird. We're going to see that there is a number of features of this group that just evade at least my usual understanding of infinite dimensional groups and central extensions and their orbits. Um, and we're going to see this weirdness appearing time and again in this talk. And so one of the points of this talk is that I want to really share this weirdness with you because uh, it's, it's been driving me crazy in the past, I guess, nearly two years. And so I hope to you know that someone can see what's going on and maybe, maybe even teach me what to do later. So that's sort of the pitch of the talk. Things work, but there are you know, terms and conditions apply. So, so we're going to see what these terms and conditions are. So like, that's can... the pitch of the Yes. Yeah, I was just wondering whether there's a reason you you drew your picture as you did and, and, and or, or that that you would think there could be a second uh a second region i guess in the euclidean case i might think it's just more natural for the geometry to actually uh close off yeah you're so in ads2 you typically think of the hyperbolic disk which of course has only one region at infinity right yeah right so indeed that's 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 a perfectly fine case, and I, I'm very willing to accept that one. In general, I'm not sure what goes on, on the, in the other direction in the plane. So for example, the coordinates I'm going to use, you will see, uh, I'm going to call them U and R, but the R coordinate in general has no reason to go from say zero, an origin to infinity. In fact, it, it could well go from minus infinity to plus infinity, and then I would genuinely have in general two asymptotic regions. I'm, I'm just not going to even address to try to address that question. I am just saying that I might have, you know, yeah, okay, mm -hmm. indeed, maybe the drawing here is um, sort of misleading because it really suggests there are two boundaries. You should really sort of, well, you can see I'm doing it on my screen now. I'm sort of hiding the left boundary so you don't see it, but of course, you know, I don't, yeah. I don't have a hand that I can show you here, but you should forget the left boundary. You should really think just of the boundaries being this, uh, wait, let me close zoom. You should think of the boundaries being this region here, and that's the one boundary with, with which I'm going to work. Okay. That's it. Now, I was just pointing because I was sort of talk, mentioning this talk to other colleagues today, and they said, "Oh, but you have to take care of the fact that there might be a second boundary." So I said, "Look, I, you know, I, I'm going to deal with just one, and then forget about the complication of maybe having a second one." But just, just at the classical level, the the action, the gravitational actions that you you would have in mind, that they, they would have both types of solutions. Is that? Both types of which solutions? What we, we... I mean, two boundary and, and one boundary solution. I, I mean, the two boundary is some Euclidean wormhole. So is, is there an yeah. example where you have that that as a saddle point solution? No, 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 no. I no. I'm really not going to talk about those at all. Indeed, I'm only going to talk about a situation where I have a single boundary and I'm going to define a boundary action on that boundary. I'm not going to try to okay. have, as you said, a wormhole situation where I have two boundaries. That's well beyond what I have in mind here. In fact, okay. we're going to see that even with one boundary, there are enough complications, if you will, to make it, uh, you know, there's quite a headache even in, with one boundary. And so if you can control one boundary, then maybe you can move on to wormholes. But for me, that's well beyond what I can control at the moment. Okay. Thanks. Sorry. Thanks. That's a good question. Thanks. Um, so yes, by the way, this is a good point to mention it. Absolutely do feel free to interrupt at any time. I have you know, tried giving this talk yesterday in my room and it lasted like 50 minutes. So 
there should be some time for questions, but please do feel free to ask, especially on Zoom. It's much nicer if people go ahead and just interrupt me. And if I don't quite finish, that's fine. I can just cut it at the end. Um, okay, so this is sort of the, the, the main message of the talk. And so with this motivation in mind, here is now the plan. Um, the first section is going to be gravitational in the sense that I'm going to introduce JT gravity in bonding gauge. Uh, and I'm going to argue that we can rewrite it as a one dimensional theory that's closely related to something that's going to resemble the BMS group. Then in the second section, I'm actually going to define a notion of BMS group in 2D and I'm going to classify its orbit. Now, you know, I'm putting the S here in parentheses. That's actually deliberate uh, because I'm going to argue that in general, you should expect that group to have a single quadrant orbit, which is one of those weirdnesses I was alluding to uh, in, the, in the introduction. And then finally, I'm going to compute the one loop uh, partition function of the theory uh, and I'm going to argue that it's one loop exact. Uh, so just before I really start, again, I mentioned that you can ask questions and I should also mention that I'm completely new to 2D gravity. So if anything is unclear, again, please do feel free to interrupt. Okay, so let me start with uh, JT gravity, which I want to rewrite as a 1D theory. So here first, I'm going to introduce bonding gauge in 2D and a specific choice of falloffs for, for my fields in the bulk. Um, then I'm going to work out the corresponding asymptotic symmetries, which will sort of introduce the BMS algebra. And then finally, I'm going to show that one has to add a boundary term to the action and thereby find that the theory is effectively described with a one dimensional uh, mechanical action on the on the boundary of, of space time. Okay, so that's the plan of this section. And so let me move on to, to, this, to, to this introduction. So um, throughout the talk, I'm going to, co to consider a two-dimensional space-time manifold that supports, supports a metric and a scalar dilaton. So these are governed by the JT uh, action functional, which I'm not going to write down for now because you don't need to know its details. What I do want to stress is that I'm going to work in bonding coordinates. And to introduce those, uh, suppose first that you just write the Minkowski metric as usual in inertial coordinates. So you have an inertial time t and some spatial coordinate r. And now in those terms, suppose that you define a retarded time u, which is given by uh, this expression here. If you plug this back into the metric, you find this expression for the metric in bonding coordinates. Now these coordinates are going to accompany us throughout the talk. So let me draw them here. You should really think of the radial coordinate as being null because d over dr is really a null vector everywhere in the bulk. And this retarded time coordinate in Minkowski space, you can think of it as a coordinate on uh, future null infinity. But in fact, I'm going to start by dealing both with ADS and a Minkowski space. And in ADS, this retarded time would actually be time-like because of this minus u squared term here in the metric. Now, what I want to do, of course, is not to deal quite with the Minkowski metric alone, but really I want to fix some falloffs um, as R goes to infinity. So I'm going to assume, first, for now, I'm going to assume that I have a finite ADS radius L so that my metric in body coordinates takes this form, which is at leading order, it's just ADS, but then there's an order R correction. Uh, and then I'm similarly, similarly going to assume an order R term for the dilaton at large R. So those are going to be my falloffs for the fields. And then, of course, you can try to solve the equations of motion for those fields. And it turns out that the solution of the equations of motion, given those falloffs, takes the form written here. So you have two arbitrary functions of time that I'm calling P and T in the metric. And you have two other arbitrary, fun well, two other functions X and Y in the dilaton, which happen to be constrained by certain ODEs, which I'm not going to write down for now. They're not crucial. The one point that I do want to stress is that, we, is that we now know exactly what the covariant phase space of the theory is. We know that this phase space consists of two functions P and T for the metric and two functions X and Y for the dilaton. And so everything we're going to do later is going to be to tell us something about those four functions P, T, X and Y. Now, in practice, we can now ask what are the asymptotic symmetries of the theory. And this is for now a question that we can ask on off shell. By the way, yes, I should mention here, this notation here, the approximate notation, doesn't mean this is an approximation. This is actually exact, but it means that those are equations that hold on shell. So when the equations of motion are satisfied, these are the equations that you should expect. Okay, so this is the solution of the equations of motion given these falloffs. But now regardless of the equations of motion, you can ask what are the asymptotic symmetries that preserve those falloffs. And again, this you can ask off shell. So you literally look for the vector fields that preserve these falloffs under lead derivation. And the result that you find turns out to be this. So the vector field that you find 
contains first this arbitrary function of time that generates a time diffeomorphism. That's sort of the DFS1 term that I mentioned earlier. And then there's another term here, which is just a function alpha, which is this radial translation that I mentioned. So this is the structure between DFS1 and translations that I mentioned in the introduction. Now, to make the structure of this algebra a bit more transparent, it helps to actually work at finite temperature, whereby you define Euclidean time phi in this way. This is chosen to be um, two pi periodic. And then in those terms, so this is really the situation I mentioned in the introduction. And then in those terms, you can define those non-abelian generators LM, which are given by replacing X by these Fourier modes. And similarly, you can, you can define abelian generators QM, which are similarly given by replacing these guys with um, a Fourier modes. And then the algebra that you find takes the form written here. Now, this by definition is the BMS2 algebra without central extensions. And abstractly, it takes the form of a semi direct sum between an algebra of vector fields on the circle, that's the first line, and an abelian algebra of one forms on the circle, that's the last line. And the fact that vector fields act on one forms is given by this second line here. Now, I really stress, because this is going to be important later, I stress that the abelian factor here consists of one forms. One way to see it is to notice the minus m appearing here on the right hand side, which equivalently tells you that the current of those one forms is going to be a function on the circle. Because you can think of, in your in CFT, you would write this as h minus one times m, where in this case, h happens to be zero. And the fact that these guys have a current which is weight zero on the circle is actually going to be important later on. So this is the algebra of off-shell asymptotic symmetries. And we can now ask how these asymptotic symmetries act on solution space. So suppose that you have those on-shell data, we ask how they transform under BMS2. So we literally compute their lead, the lead derivative, for example, of this metric under BMS2. If you do this, what you will find is this transformation law for the functions C and P. So there's a structure here to which I'm going to return later. But for now, just notice that there's a factor two here, which confirms that this uh, function T is in fact a quasi-primary with weight two. In fact, here it's even a primary because there's no zero standard charge. Whereas the transformation law of P has a factor one here, which tells you that P is density with weight one. Now that's fine, but there's just one issue, which is that I just pointed out that the current for translations must have weight zero. So where is it hidden in these transformation laws? Well, the answer turns out to be that it's actually hidden in P. In fact, what you can do is define P to be a zero mode C plus some total derivative of function Q. And then you may ask how this function Q transforms under uh, asymptotic symmetries. And the transformation law we're going to find is this one written here. And as you can see, this now really has zero weight. This is now a current with zero weight, which is the current for translations. And I really stress that, you know, you should think of this Q term as being the one that specifies P, but it's not P that's the current for translations. As you will see, this is going to be important later on in the talk. In particular, notice, of course, that Q is only defined up to a constant because you only see Q prime in the metric. You never quite see Q. So in particular, this pair TQ will, in fact, be a quadrant vector for the BMS2 group. And it will also turn out later on that this pair XY, so the components of the dilaton, are essentially going to be specified by a group element in BMS2. Notice, by the way, that all the formulas I have written down here are formulas that, as in prism, so when I write prime here, I really mean derivatives with respect to uh, retarded time u, but you'd equally, you could equally vicrotate everything. And if you do it in accordance with the conformal weight of whatever field you're vicrotating, so for example, when you vicrotate t, you would say that the Euclidean version of t is something like beta squared times the Lorentzian t. If you do this, you will see that these same formulas actually hold in the theory at final temp finite temperature. So this sort of depends on your, on your choice for Vic rotation. We're choosing a Vic rotation such that this is true. So that all formulas we wrote in Euclid in a Lorentzian signature also work in a Euclidean signature. Um, so I have now achieved a sort of, I guess I have introduced, so are there any questions at this stage? This is sort of a preliminary from which I can proceed later. So I know the phase space of metrics and dilatons I'm going to consider. I know the transformation laws under BMS2, and I want to move on to uh, the, act, the action of the theory. Shall I? I shall. OK, so let me talk about the boundary action. So in order to talk about the action, well, first, let me give you the bulk action. So the Jackie Steinbohm action, uh, which I'm going to write in this way. So let me introduce some notation here. 
First, what I'm calling kappa here is sort of the inverse of Newton's constant in 2D, whatever, it's normalization of the action. Then you have the standard JT integral of a dilaton times curvature. What I'm calling L as before is the ADS radius. And notice that I am introducing by hand what I'm calling lambda, which is not a cosmological constant. It's a vacuum energy. And in fact, I'm going to use this terminology of vacuum energy for lambda in order to distinguish it from the cosmological constant, which is minus one over L squared, because it's a cosmological constant that affects the value of curvature. By contrast, the vacuum energy does not affect curvature, but it does affect the dynamics of the dilaton. In fact, in pure ADS, you can, of course, always reabsorb this lambda by just shifting your dilaton by a constant. But my whole, whole point is that I eventually want to work in the flat limit. And in that case, I'm not going to be able to reabsorb this uh, vacuum energy in any way. So this is why, this is why I want to keep both parameters uh, explicit throughout. So OK, you should think of this as the bulk action of your theory. And you can now ask, if you, if you vary it, what are the equations of motion that you find? So you find the equations of motion that I, I mentioned earlier, but you also find that there is a non-zero boundary term here, which happens to take this form. And so what this tells you is that this bulk action by itself is not differentiable. You cannot differentiate it with respect to field configurations given the fall of conditions you've chosen. And so you have to add an extra boundary term to the action. Now, it turns out that the boundary term you find is the one written here. So it sort of seems to come out of the blue as presented here. So let me tell you a few words about it. First, this term Tx minus Py, uh, in a sense, we can sort of guess it just by looking at this, because you can see that it compensates these, variation, these variations of delta, t, delta P and delta P. But then in addition, it adds extra delta X and delta Y variations, which are sort of canceled by these extra terms on the right. In particular, this lambda Y term is a term that you can actually compensate by shifting y in this expression here. But again, in the flat limit where the ADS radius goes to infinity, this term goes away. And then this becomes really important for the dynamics. So that's the boundary that action that you find. And the point of writing it in this way is that it's designed in such a way that even when you vary uh, the action off shell, you find again the equations of motion plus this boundary term. But now this boundary term, as you can see, is a variation of the integral of 1 over x times a certain combination of field components that happens to be constant on shell. So on shell, you can actually pull that constant out and just say that delta s on shell is a constant times this variation of the integral of 1 over x. So what this suggests is that you can now impose an extra boundary condition saying that the integral of 1 over x is some constant. And again, this is a constraint you can impose both in the Lorentzian theory and in the Euclidean theory by just recrotating the field X according to its conformal weight. And then if you do this, so you from now on, we impose that this is true off shell, then in fact, this variation becomes zero on shell. So we really find now a differentiable action. And so in what follows, uh, I'm going to use this as my boundary action for the theory. By the way, just a little pause. I need to put a charger in my computer, otherwise it's going to switch off in 30 seconds. Sorry, are there any questions at this stage just to ask since we're on June and since we have a sort of a, a full break of a few seconds? If you were to write this uh, extra boundary condition uh, directly in terms of the scalar, uh, what it would look like? Oh, uh, you mean, so if I were not to decompose my scalar into X and Y like I did, but if yeah. I really were to try to write it in terms of the scalar, uh, that's a very good question. I really don't know. Mm -hmm. I haven't even tried to do it this way. Uh, do you think there is an intrinsic way to write it? Like in terms of, I guess, you know, because uh, in this business of uh, quantizing to the gravity, you have this sort of, so there's a dual picture that I'm, I'm not adopting here, but you could talk about one dimensional boundaries and that are sort of curved in space time, they're close to a cutoff, at least in ADS, you, you sort of have a cutoff that you eventually set to, to, to zero. Um, and then you would have perhaps a notion of extrinsic curvature or something like that. I'm, not, I'm, I'm really not sure if there's a way to write it in this way here. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Is that what you have in mind? Yeah, indeed, indeed, something like that. Okay, okay. So I, I, I to be honest, I believe there's a paper by Jakob Salzer and others who does exactly that translation in ADS2, 
uh, but I'm not aware of the details. And in any case, I'm not even sure it's well established in ADS2. I just saw Ye Jakob today, actually, and he, he, you know, he seemed, he didn't seem to know exactly how to do this translation. I mean, he, he he's clearly sort of the specialist on this, and and it doesn't seem to be known. Okay, so if it's not not known in ADS2 in usual, I guess, ADM coordinates. I wouldn't expect it to be known in bond gauge. Maybe, maybe Charles knows a bit more about this, but I, I'm not aware of it. Um, so Thanks. No, I don't know, I don't know. So in any case, uh, from now on, we have this boundary action to work with. And from now on, I'm sort of going to study that boundary action. So if this bulk constraint is satisfied, the action of the full action of the theory actually boils down to this boundary action plus lambda times volume term. Now, in this approach I'm adopting, where I'm not embedding sort of, you know, these um, self-avoiding paths in ADS or anything, I'm just talking about the full space-time, this lambda times the volume term is just an infrared divergent term, so it's a constant in the action, I can just disregard it, and my action boils down to this expression here. Now, this was the Lorentzian action, and as I said, when you move on to the um, Euclidean theory, Essentially, everything remains the same, thanks to our prescription for weak rotation, except you have to multiply the action by a factor of i. So that's what I'm doing here. This is now the Euclidean action. And from now on, I'm mostly going to study the Euclidean action. Now, what I'm now going to do as a sort of preparation for what follows is to relate this whole quantity to the BMS2 group. So as a starting point, I'm going to start from this constraint and use it in order to write x as 1 over f prime, where this function f is well, it's not actually a function on the circle. If you will, it's a function with unit winding on the circle and strictly positive derivative. In other words, it's really a diffeomorphism of the circle. So I'm going to write x as a diffeomorphism of the circle, if you will. And then I'm just going to rewrite the other component y of the dilaton as a new function alpha. Then if you plug those two redefinitions into this action here on top, what you're going to find is this sort of complicated expression for the action. So a few comments. For example, the term t over f prime is a remnant of t times x, which we had earlier in the action. This c plus q prime is just what they called p earlier. And so p times alpha is what they really called p times y. So you see that those terms are the same tx minus py as before. And then there's a bunch of these other terms. There's an f prime prime. There's this term here, which I want to spend some time on because, well, just look at what this term is. This is minus, so you have 1 over f prime times f prime squared times alpha composed with f. So what this really is, is integral over phi of alpha. In other words, this whole thing integrated over phi is just the zero mode of alpha. It's the constant Fourier mode, the zero Fourier mode of alpha. Now, in standard approaches to, uh, I guess, JT or flat JT, you would actually set this guy to zero. You would just by hand say that you impose an extra boundary condition saying this component is zero. I am emphatically not going to do that. If I were to do this, I would re reduce this whole thing to the Schwarzen of the so-called warped Virazoro group. But here, I emphatically want to avoid the warped Virazoro group and remain within BMS2. And so I'm not going to impose any condition on the zero mode. Instead, I'm going to leave it completely arbitrary and it's going to fluctuate. And in fact, I'm going to integrate over it in the, in the path integral. Finally, there is this term here, which as you can see, is the only term that comes with a term of the cosmological constant, an ADS radius. And so in the flat limit, in flat space, where the bulk uh, curvature is zero, this term just goes to zero. And so from now on, this is the action with which I'm going to work. What I'm now going to argue, and so this is sort of the point of, so the, the end, this is the end of the first section. And what I'm now going to claim is that this whole quantity can be thought of as a BMS Schwarzen action plus standard charge times the zero mode of alpha. And I stress again that the standard charge really is the zero mode of an arbitrary function in the metric now. And so thanks to that zero mode, we're going to have saddle points. I'm also going to argue that this BMS Schwarzen action is sort of ill-behaved in a certain way. So that's what I'm now going to do. And this requires that I really define the BMS group in 2D. Uh, by the way, I'm calling this section the BMS2 group and its orbit. And again, the fact that this, this you know, the fact that there's no S here on the right is not a typo. It's deliberate because I'm going to argue that the BMS2 group generically has a single quadrant orbit. So the plan here is first, I'm going to define the BMS2 group. Uh, then I'm going to work out the corresponding quadrant representation. And from that, I'm going to deduce two things. First, uh, the existence of a single orbit. And secondly, a notion of a BMS Schwarzen action, which I'm then going to compare to the JT action that they've just derived. 
Okay, so in order to define BMS2, well, at least if you forget about central extensions, the main thing you should do is just recall what the algebra was and just sort of integrate it into a group. And it's sort of obvious that the group is diffeomorphisms of the time-like circle acting on one forms, which are your radial translations. So if you neglect central extensions, that's the group. The elements of that group are, again, going to be pairs F alpha, where F is a diffeo and alpha is a one form. And we saw before that the corresponding Lie algebra consists of pairs of this pairs of this form with brackets written by written oh, well in this form before. So all this we have already encountered. What we now have to do in principle is to define a notion of centrally extended group. Now this is something we do in fact in the paper. In the paper we uh, sort of first introduce the centrally extended group, and then from that group we deduce an adjoint representation, a quadrant, and the Lie bracket. But here, for pedagogical purposes, I'm actually going to introduce everything, all central charges, only in terms of the Lie algebra, because it's much easier to write down. So for example, if you sort of stare at the first line of this equation, of this, uh, these, I guess, commutation relations, it's very clear that you can extend this into a Virozor algebra. You should expect to have a central charge, which I'm going to call A. I'm calling it A because it's the first, first central charge I'm introducing, and because the letter C is reserved for the zero mode of the function P. So that's why I'm calling it A. Uh, then in the second line of, so this is sort of this line where there are no surprises. This is the Verzor algebra, you should have expected it. But then the second line is the one where surprises are hidden because you now have a centrally extended Verzor generator that's going to commute with some new centrally extended translation generator. And if you actually, actually sort of study the cohomology of this algebra, what you find is that there are two allowed central extensions here. One, which I'm calling B, so it's a central charge B, times m, so it's linear in derivatives, if you will. And then there's a second central charge c, which comes with no factor of m. So it's sort of like a Heisenberg central extension. And finally, if you try to look for a central extension in the QQ bracket, there turns out to be nothing there. So you see that the only, you know, even in the central extended group, these translations are going to remain abelian. Now, as I said, this means there are three central extensions. In fact, this was classified by mathematicians at the level of uh, the Lie algebra. Uh, long ago. And I'm going to argue crucially that two of those central charges are non-zero in flat GT. In fact, this central charge C is deliberately called in this way because it's actually the zero mode of the function P in the metric. And this central charge B happens to be minus one. So it's very much relevant to understand those central extensions in order to understand uh, flat GT gravity. Notice, by the way, that this is an extension of the warped Verzor algebra. Indeed, for non-zero m, you can define new generators pm by this expression here. And you can define p naught by this expression in terms of the central charge c. So this is consistent with the fact that the central charge c is in fact the zero mode of the function p. And then in terms of these pm guys, the algebra that you find takes the form here. So this is really a warped Verzor algebra with a non-zero twist with, with a zero uh, u1 level. In fact, most of the literature really, as I sort of pointed out earlier, most of the literature restricts attention precisely to this warped Verzor algebra. Most of the literature doesn't even deal with BMS2, but we don't. For better or worse, we really wanted to push the BMS2 story as far as possible, and so that's what I'm going to do. So in particular, I'm really going to keep not the warped Verzor point of view, but I'm going to do everything in terms of BMS2. So you should now assume that I have given you this algebra here, and that I can write down for you the corresponding centrally extended group. This is something, again, we do in the paper. I'm not doing it here uh, for the sake of simplicity. So assuming we have that group, we can now ask, start asking questions about, for example, its quadrant representation. Now, just sort of to fix the ideas, you should recall that the quadrant representation, by definition, is the action of a Lie group on the dual of its Lie algebra. And these words, dual of the Lie algebra, in physical terms, really mean the currents of whatever symmetry this is. So for example, in this case, we know that the BMS2 algebra consists of vector fields and one forms. So we know that the corresponding dual is going to consist of dual vector fields, meaning quadratic densities T, and functions on the circle, meaning these functions Q that I mentioned earlier. And then by definition, the pairing between the BMS algebra and its dual is given by this sort of Noether charge obtained by integrating all these quantities over the circle. And then the quadrant representation by definition is given by acting, you know, you declared it by acting with a symmetry parameter x on the current t, 
Well, that's the same as composing T with the bracket with X. That's the definition of the quadrant representation, in fact, for essentially any group. And so if you now apply these definitions to uh, the BMS2 algebra that we know, all you, have to, so all you have to take care of is the fact that you now have to add central charges into the story and you use the brackets I wrote in the previous slide. The transformation laws that you find are the one written here. Now, what's striking about these things is that those are exactly the gravitational transformation laws in the flat limit, provided you take a vanishing the reserve central charge B to be minus one and the central charge C to be P naught. This is what I sort of advertised in the previous slide. Now, because these transformations are going to be quite important in what follows, I would like to spend just some time to tell you what the intuition is behind these equations, because it's not quite obvious maybe where they come from. For example, this term x times q prime really tells, you can notice that there is no term of the form x prime times q. So what this tells you is that q really is a density with weight zero. It's a scalar current, has no, uh, no, no conform, it has zero conformal weight. And then you can see that those two terms, bx prime and c times x are central extensions. Notice that b comes with one derivative, which is consistent with the fact that it's multiplied by m in the algebra. And this other term has no derivatives, which is again consistent with the fact that you can think of it as a sort of Heisenberg central extension. A similar argument applies to T, which here you can see is a quadratic density, just like a CFT stress tensor. Notice also that there's a term alpha Q prime here, which has a neat interpretation because we're dealing with a semi-direct product. So it's sort of a generalization of the Euclidean group or the Poincaré group. So what this term tells you is that uh, if you act with a translation on a state with non, sorry, a translation alpha on a state with non-zero momentum Q, you're generally going to change the orbital angular momentum T. So that's what this term is. It's really sort of an, uh, a BMS analog of the usual cross product between a translation and the momentum. Um, and then the remaining terms are just central extensions as before. As before. So there really is a neat intuition be be behind these transformations, which you can sort of explain by the BMS2 group. Now, the question is, what are the corresponding finite transformation laws? I've written all this in terms of the representation of the Lie algebra, but I can, I can, of course, ask the same question for the group. And so that's what I'm now going to write down. In particular, these finite transformations are actually going to be crucial in order to write down the Schwarzen action. So it's really something we need to address. So in order to write down those finite transformation laws, one way that you can follow is to first, as we did in the paper, define the group and from there deduce the quadrant representation. But here again, for the sake of, uh, you know, for pedagogical purposes, that's not what I'm going to do. Instead, I'm going to sort of integrate those transformation laws. So if I declare that my quadrant representation maps TQ on something I'm going to call T tilde Q tilde, if you sort of stare at this equation and try to find what the corresponding finite transformation is, it's sort of obvious that you should have something like Q tilde, which is just Q. So this first term tells you that this is just a function. Again, it has zero weight. And then these two other terms are central extensions. Notice in particular and this, that this central term times F minus phi, to our knowledge, is completely new in the literature. We never found this sort of expression anywhere, even in mathematics. So, you know, at least to me, uh, part of the fun of this project was in finding these exotic co-cycles appearing in the transformation law. And then for the stress tensor T, you can run sort of a similar game and try to ask how, how it transforms and the result turns out to be written here. So in short, you find this term T over F prime squared, which tells you that this guy uh, has weight two. You find here this orbital angular momentum that I mentioned earlier, and then all the other terms are sort of central terms. So now that we have those finite quadrant transformation laws, we can start asking questions about orbits. And so in that context, the main result we have, which I guess you can call it a theorem because it's really rigorous, is the following. The theorem is that if you take real and non-zero central charges BC, regardless of what A is, then in fact, if you sort of look at this transformation law for Q, you can immediately conclude that there exists a unique circle diffeomorphism F that maps Q on zero. So I really want to stress how unusual this is. This means, in, you know, in terms of momenta, for example, if you think of Q as a sort of momentum because it's dual translations, what this tells you is that every particle has a rest frame. There exists no tachyons and no massless particles. Every particle can be mapped to a frame where it has exactly zero momentum and zero, even zero energy. So it's very peculiar. 
And furthermore, this diffeomorphism that does this is unique. So in a sense, there's a bijection between the space of all possible Qs and the space of all possible diffeomorphisms. Furthermore, if you actually do this, so you map Q on Q tilde, which is zero, you can also see that there exists a unique translation alpha that now maps this guy T on T tilde equals zero. So in other words, every point of uh, every quadrant vector of BMS2 can be mapped on a single vector zero comma zero. In other words, the whole BMS2 group has a single quadrant orbit. And this is sort of where you start seeing the weirdness I was alluding to initially. This is something that doesn't normally happen. In the Virozoro group, you have orbits of strictly positive codimension. You have a foliation of the dual space in terms of interesting quadrant orbits. Here, there's no such foliation. The whole dual space itself is a huge quadrant orbit. I should mention that complexification changes these things drastically. And in fact, we're going to see this on the next slide. And it's also going to play a role for the partition function. So it's going to be really important. Uh, but at least in terms of the real BMS2 group, which is, I guess, what mathematicians would normally consider the BMS2 group, this is the result that you find. Now, a related question is, what's the Schwarzen action of the group? Now, that's sort of easy to write down, at least formally, simply because by definition, the Schwarzen is the generator of the U1 action on the quadrant orbit. In this case, the U1 action is sort of generated by the zero mode of this T tilde, so the stress tensor on an orbit. And so if you just you know, take the T tilde written here, plug it back into the action, the Schwarzen action that you're going to find takes this form written here. Now, you know, there's a number of properties you can check here, but perhaps the most tracking one is the fact, so yeah, several things. First, you can see that this expression is very, very close to the Euclidean action of flat JT. In fact, it differs from that action just by the zero mode C times alpha naught. This is the zero mode I mentioned earlier. And in fact, it turns out to be a crucial zero mode. Because if you do not include these remotes, if you, if you sort of hide this quantity and decide to really only work with the Schwarzen action of BMS, you can immediately verify that this action has no saddle points. You can write the corresponding equations of motion and they're, well, the only solution they're going to have is sort of zero. There's nothing that's going, actually, not, actually that's not even true. Not even the identity solve the equations of motions, the equations of motion. There's really an inconsistency, if you will, which tells you that this Schwarzen action by itself has no saddle point. Now, unfortunately, unfortunately, I don't have a proof of this, but I suspect that this is closely related to the fact that the BMS2 group has a unique orbit. You see, in the case of Eurozoro, the fact that you have a foliation of the dual space by orbits is in the end responsible for the presence of saddle points. You may recall that the saddle point is typically located at the point of a minimal energy of an orbit. Well, here you would expect something similar, but because there's a unique orbit, there is no minimum of energy, and so there's no saddle points. So there seems to be a correspondence between the existence of you know, a unique orbit and the lack of saddle points. So what I'm now going to do and what follows is to take this action, which is the Schwarzen plus a crucial zero mode. And that crucial zero mode, it turns out, is going to be responsible for the presence of a saddle point and the possibility to actually evaluate a one loop partition function. Before I mention the partition function, actually, let me ask at this stage, are there any questions? Yeah, if there are no questions, I can just proceed. Uh, but actually, before talking about the partition function, uh, let me mention something about the complexification, because I mentioned that the real BMS2 group with real central charges has a unique orbit. But if you complexify, things may change. And to see that they change, let's look again at the transformation law of these currents under the Lie algebra. Now, specifically, let's, let's ask, if I give you a pair TQ, what's the stabilizer of that particular pair? The stabilizer here means that you would have to set the left-hand side to zero and think of these two equations as uh, linear differential equations for two unknown functions, namely the vector field X and the one form alpha. Now, it turns out that if you think of this as complex differential equations, generally with complex currents and complex central charges, in fact, you find that complex periodic solutions do exist now. So the stabilizer is non-trivial, but they actually do exist only if this condition is satisfied. So if C over B is an, imag in a, is an imaginary integer. So first, just to really stress what this means. This means that with complex central charges that satisfy this constraint, you can in fact have a non-trivial stabilizer, which is to say that your orbit does have now a strictly positive codimension. So you're sort of curing the situation 
but it's not really clear why having at least at the level of the group if you just stare at it it's not clear why why there seems to be this sort of enhancement of the stabilizer for these discrete values of c or b but if you actually think back of the metric <laughs> there is in fact a very simple uh, geometric reason and it has to do with the following fact so suppose that you write the metric in this way and specifically, let's even write the corresponding Euclidean metric. So now I'm writing everything in terms of the angle phi, and I'm recrotating the metric. Now, suppose that you just set you know, q and t to 0. Then you can verify that when c is i times an integer, then in fact, this metric is an n-fold cover of the Euclidean plane. And of course, the Euclidean plane, or even the n-fold cover of the Euclidean plane at infinity at least, uh, have a non-trivial three-dimensional isometry group, which is just the Euclidean group. And so this is where the, this enhancement of the stabilizer comes from. It comes from the fact that, in fact, for those reasons, keep in mind, by the way, that in the metric formalism, b equals minus 1. So c over b is just minus c. So that's why this comes about. So this, in a sense, explains why we see this sort of symmetry enhancement for these discrete values, discrete purely imaginary values of c over b. Uh, and in fact, it's going to be important later when talking about the partition function. Just one more note, which again is going to be uh, relevant for the partition function. You should note that I've looked here for stabilizers of orbits of BMS2, but the notion of stabilizer for a metric uh, is much more lax. And the reason is because the metric only involves Q prime, not Q. So when looking for the stabilizer of this metric, I can just set this right-hand side here not to be zero, but actually any constant. And so whenever I have a solution x of this equation with, a, with any constant on the left-hand side, that still counts as a stabilizer of the metric, even though it's not a stabilizer of the corresponding BMS2 quadrant orbit. So this is, again, yet another of these weirdnesses where there's a mismatch between the stabilizer of a metric and the stabilizer of a BMS2 orbit. Question? OK, yes. When I set c equals to minus i, this is to say n equals to 1, this would, this would correspond to the um, to the thermal solution, right? The, the, the disk solution. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. That's exactly the uh, the thermal disk. Exactly. Okay. And then the other ones are sort of n-fold covers of this. By the way, in ADS, I'm I like my background is more in 3D gravity. And in fact, in 3D gravity, you have a very similar uh, symmetry enhancement with n-fold covers of the maximally symmetric solution. In ADS3, you would have non-trivial isometries for ADS3, and then you have conical quantized conical excesses of ADS3 that have sort of an SL, well, that have a, an SL2R isometry that's generated by these Verzoromos LN, L minus N, and L0. Mm -hmm. So this is sort of similar. It's a 2D analog, analog of that. In the, in the ADS2 case, uh, we have ordinary JT gravity. Is this, yeah. this enhancement that you're referring to, um, is it the same thing that I get for the Schwarzian theory when I, I'm looking at a disk partition function yeah. versus a generic. Absolutely. It's absolutely okay. the same thing. And also, in terms of the partition function, you know that depending, depending on the background, you're going to have a different scaling of the partition function with temperature. You know, yeah. You're going to have this three half. We're going to see the exact same thing here right now. Okay. I'm getting there. OK, so uh, this is, I think I'm actually OK with time, right? I have like 15 minutes. Yeah, definitely. You're good. Amazing, amazing. So my counting was right. Okay, fine. Uh, okay, again, please don't, in, don't hesitate to interrupt. So this is the third and last section of the talk, and it's also the shortest. So I want here to talk, tell you about the partition function, and in particular, I'm going to argue that there are some, again, a light motive of this talk is uh, the sort of pathology or weirdness of BMS2. And so here again, we're going to see that there's something weird going on. And so to emphasize how weird this is, I'm going to start by reminding you very briefly of how the one loop partition function works for the usual Schwarzen theory in ADS2. And then I'm going to compare that to what happens for the BMS Schwarzen with the zero mode. Now, in order to first, first recall what happens in ADS2, which was the computation done in this paper uh, back in 2017. So what, what's the computation? And typically, the Schwarzen partition function that you write takes the form written here. You have to integrate a Schwarzen action. So you're integrating the zero mode of uh, a stress tensor, but you're of a CFT stress tensor, but you're, you're really integrating that zero mode over an orbit of the Verzor group. Indeed, your Fs here, you know, the functions over which you're integrating are all given by some circle diffeomorphism F that acts on some reference stress tensor T, and you're going to sum 
not quite over all the Fs, but actually over all the Fs modulo the stabilizer. So you're really integrating over the orbit. Now, a key point of these considerations, of course, is that because you're integrating over an orbit, you're typically not going to pick just any stress tensor T. Instead, you're going to write your stress tensor T as some, uh, some fixed diffeomorphism G that acts on some reference stress tensor T naught. And typically, the T naught you're going to choose in some convenient way, for example, you're going to choose T naught to be just a constant. It's not going to be some crazy profile on a circle. It's really just going to be some constant weight. Now, the trick is that you crucially want this partition function to not depend on your choice of orbit representative. And so in order to achieve this, you have to assume that this measure here is right invariant so that when integrating over f, that's the same as integrating over f times g, where I've chosen the same g as the one that appears here. And then if I just rename fg into f, my partition function is back to what it was before, except I've now traded my initial stress tensor t for another stress tensor t naught, which lives on the same quadrant orbit. So what this means is that this uh, th the value of the path integral is by construction independent of your choice of orbit representative on a quadrant orbit of the Virasor group. And then in that language, you may realize, for example, that this quantity here, so the you know the zero mode of uh, f dot t naught, that's in fact a Hamiltonian function that generates a u1 action on a quadrant orbit with respect to the Kirill of constant uh, symplectic form. And this, in a sense, immediately allows you to use uh, Deuster, the deuterman heckman uh, theorem, which ensures in the end that the partition function is one loop exact. So there's really a sequence of arguments here that starts from writing the Schwarzen action, choosing a right invariant measure, using the fact that this is U1 generator, and thereby finding a one loop localization. Now, the question is, can you do something similar with the BMS Schwarzian plus zero mode that we have found in the case of flat JT gravity? And I'm going to argue there that, in a sense, you can do something very similar, but there's a catch. So the catch is the following. Uh, you write the partition function in this way. So now you would have to integrate over BMS2 variables, a diff S1 element F and a transition alpha. And then the action that you have to put in the exponential is going to be this action that I wrote, which, as you recall, was a BMS Schwarzian minus a zero mode. Now, this zero mode is going to be crucial because that's the guy that's going to change things. For example, the whole action for one thing is not just a Schwarzian. It's certainly not just a generator of U1. It's something else, and we have to deal with that. Now, and, and not only that, but actually, you might think, you know, at some point, we, before we sort of realized there, were, there was no saddle point, we thought of just using the BMS Schwarzian in this sort of path partition function computation. But you have to recall that the pure Schwarzian has no saddle point. So, it doesn't even make sense to talk about the one loop partition function because there's no saddle point. So you have to pay the price of adding a zero mode in order to actually have a saddle point. Now, despite the zero mode, you can try to proceed anyway in the way you typically did uh, in the Schwarzen action. So in particular, you may recall that BMS2 has a unique orbit for generic values of the central charges. So you can decide to write your pair of currents TQ as some BMS element G beta that acts on 0, 0, You can just choose this as your reference configuration, whereby this term here, you would just write it as G beta acting on 0. Now, that's fine. And then the next step would be to choose a right invariant measure here, which, for, which you can certainly do, because it's a Lie group. Of course, it's an infinite dimensional Lie group, but you can still choose a right invariant measure, and thereby sort of cancel the presence of this G beta term here. The issue is that, of course, this is fine as far as the right environment is concerned, but this zero mode C alpha naught is now going to be affected by this because what's going to happen here on the right hand side is, you know, if you try to replace F alpha by alpha alpha times G beta, in particular, you're going to have here a zero mode, which is alpha naught plus beta naught. So what you really have to do is say, OK, let me replace alpha naught by alpha naught plus beta naught minus beta naught. And then this beta naught is actually going to contribute here a sort of tree level term to the path integral. So let's do that. So as I said, you find a tree level term here. And now I've used right invariance to just cancel this term here. So I have the usual f alpha acting on 0 now, on the 0 stress tensor, minus c times the 0 mod of alpha. And then this remaining integral now is one loop exact. In fact, in our paper, by the way, we didn't even write this term. We just performed sort of this integral here. In fact, we performed it for arbitrary t naught and q naught, but we never tried to phrase it in terms of this invariant here. This, by the way, is one of my puzzles with this whole thing, because 
in the case of Euro zero, this classical value of the, um, the, the tree level value of the action is sort of the invariant that specifies which orbit you're on. But in this case, there is no invariant to begin with because there is a single orbit. So I don't know how to interpret this beta not term. So if anyone has, you know, if anyone at some point is capable of say, telling me what this is, I'll be very interested. In any case, we can just proceed. You know, this is something we can compute. The beta not is a, an explicit, it's an ugly, but an explicit functional of T and Q. You can compute it and you can plug it here. And then you're left with this sort of one loop integral. Uh, and the fact, the reason that the interval is one loop exact is in the end very simple, it has to do with the fact that this alpha field appears linearly and in the end acts like a Lagrange multiplier. In fact, in the end, you just have to integrate a, delta, a derived delta function on the orbit and you just have to compute a functional determinant uh, at the point where the delta function localizes. And so, uh, yes. Oh, sorry, I, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, about this extra term that you just mentioned, uh, how should I think about this beta not uh, when That's thinking about yes, when, thi when thinking about the the geometric perspective on the partition function that you're computing? Let's say I'm working with a disk. What it, what is this beta not? Oh, if you're so okay, if you're working with a, a simple background, meaning one for which t and q are constant, say t not and q not, then beta not equals t not. It's just a constant. You can think of it as the on-shell value of the action. Okay. The problem is that that's generally not true. If I give you T and Q, which are some profiles on the circle and they happen to be, you know, very wiggly, um, this beta naught is some complicated, actually non-local functional of T and Q. It's explicit. I, can, I haven't written it down here because, you know, it's long. It's explicit and you can compute it, but I have no clue what it's supposed to represent. In a sense, that's sort of one of the things I was trying to say here. Uh, in the Virazoro case, in the Schwarzen action, you have a similar tree level term, but you know exactly how to interpret it. You, you know that what I would call beta naught in this case, in the, in the Virazoro case, that would be sort of the value of, I guess, the, uh, the monodromy matrix that the, the invariant trace of the monodromy matrix that specifies your Virazoro quadrant orbit which is sort of like an analog of the mass of a particle. It's really, you know, it's like a mass squared that is just a bit more complicated. Here, to my knowledge, there is no notion of mass squared because there's a single orbit. So I really don't know how to think of this term. One way to think of it, by the way, is to say the following. No, so I mentioned that BMS2 has a unique orbit, but that's not true of the warped Virazoro group. And so you can say, let me consider an element of the warped Virazoro subgroup, meaning I'm going to restrict beta such that it has vanishing zero mode. I, I deliberately declare that beta uh, has beta naught, which is zero. And then what's going to happen is that I'll be able to write TQ as G beta times something which is constant on the right-hand side. And that constant is going to be the one that appears here at tree level, in fact. Okay. So in a sense, you can think of this as a warped Virazor invariant, I presume, but I haven't tried to, I, I, I haven't tried, in fact, to make this precise, but I think it's really a warped Verzoro orbit invariant as opposed to a BMS2 invariant. <laughs> That's the best interpretation I can give of it. Another sort of a more uh, down to earth maybe interpretation is it's simply the tree level term of the, of the partition function. It's the tree level term and this whole integral is going to be a pure one loop term. That's it. Okay, okay. And indeed this is what okay, we're now going to see. In fact, if you, ah, Sean, you had a question? Sorry, sorry, F finish what you were saying. No, I was just going to say, I'm going to move on to the next slide. So go ahead. Oh, okay, so I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, the, so you said the BMS2 group has a unique orbit. So yeah. in principle, I can access. Oh yeah, so but you're saying you have, you have more, so you still have, because uh, in, 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 in the way we look at this, um, at this theory, uh, we have, uh, uh, constant representatives, and this define uh, sort of uh, sort of the vacuum uh, vacuum solution, and then we act yeah. on it with the asymptotic symmetries and create yeah. a whole orbit. Um, yes. yes. With this, with this, you know, seed. Yeah. Um, and here you're saying that there's only one seed uh, because there's only one orbit. But with respect I guess, to BMS two, yes. But it's for it's for the it's you have a one orbit for the BMS two, but I guess not for the 
metric right you, you still have various uh wait why, why not in, 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 do, do you still have various inequivalent solutions that, like what i mean is that i um you see for yeah. example in ads oh, uh, oh, oh wait 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 one thing okay do keep in mind okay yes so do keep in mind that from this perspective the zero mode of the function p is a central charge it does not change right mm, yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah so yeah. what i'm saying here is that within a class of metrics that all have the same zero mode for the function p okay i can reach any two such i can connect any two such metrics with the bms2 transformation however yeah. i cannot change the value of that zero mode so you have, if i have two metrics that happen to have different zero modes for this function p those for sure i cannot connect by a bms2 transformation because the zero mode of p is in fact a central charge there's really there's literally no transformation that's ever going to change that yeah. And this is, by the way, consistent with the warped Verozoro orbit classification, where the zero mode of P, uh, people don't normally call it a central charge, but it actually is. Sometimes we call it the Casimir. It's the Casimir that specifies warped Verozoro coordinate orbits. That Casimir also does not change. In fact, it is the thing that does not change when you apply warped Verozoro transformations. So it's really the same thing, except I'm phrasing it in a BMS2 way where I have, essentially, I have one more generator, if you will. In the symmetry algebra. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That, does that work? Okay. Good. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Um, all right. So this is the partition function we have. So this is going to be the classical term. This is going to be uh, the, the the just the one loop correction. And so to compute this correction, we're going to focus on uh, expanding solutions around the settle point, expanding things in Fourier modes, and plugging plugging that back into this uh, circle integral, and then just computing the thing. So I'm skipping the details. And so if I let M be a Fourier index and expand around the settle point, the partition function I find is a classical term times the term coming from the measure, this is sort of the Pfaffian of the Kirill of constant symplectic form evaluated at the identity times the result of whatever Gaussian integrals are here on the right-hand side. Notice first that this uh, Pfaffian here uh, in the measure is going to cancel the result of those Gaussian integrals. At least it's going to do so for most generic values of C and B, of course, if C over B happens to be an imaginary integer, there's going to be some divergence here. And that's something where, well, it's not a divergence actually, it's just a direction over which you should not even integrate. And so that's where we see that the complex, complexification, complexification plays an important role. But for generic values of C and B, these two guys just cancel out. And I should also mention that if I had um, explicitly used Matsubara frequencies, I would have a factor of beta squared here in this second infinite product. And so then if I sort of zeta function regular regulates the whole uh, expression, the partition function that we find at the end happens to have this classical term times the power of beta uh, here on the right hand side. Notice again that there's a difference in the scaling depending on the value of C over B. So for generic values of these central charges, I have one over beta as in the Schwarzen theory, uh, as in the sorry, as in the warp Schwarzen theory. But then for these symmetry enhanced situations, there's a beta to the minus three half. So, so there's really the same sort of, you know, the usual argument of the counting works where you say that the three half comes from the fact that you have a three dimension stabilizer, which in this case is just uh, an n-fold cover of the Euclidean loop. And so this sort of looks like what you have in ADS, which I guess is a sort of a good note to bring me to the conclusion of the talk. And I'm really, I'm really fine with time. This is nice. I have like one minute for the conclusion. Perfect. Can I ask a question about the previous slide? Oh yeah, 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 sure, sure. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So. Um... In, in JD gravity, I have a, a similar enhancement of the symmetry. And in that case, I have that the disk, uh, one of the, the enhanced result corresponds to the disk and the unenhanced result. In fact, one can interpret when one analyzes what is the geometrical saddle, one is computing the partition, the function about, one sees that that corresponds to uh, something that one could call a trumpet, uh, where you yeah. have actually two boundaries. Yeah. Um, is there... I mean, I understand the second line, beta to the minus three halves, is the analogous thing to the disk. What should I think uh, of the geometrical saddle that I am computing this par partition function about in the generic case, where I have the one over beta? Cylinder. It's the cylinder. cylinder. It's the cylinder. And in fact, the beta minus one tells you have two, you know, the isometries of the cylinder are rotations around the cylinder and translations along the cylinder. That's where you have the beta minus one. 
That's exactly the counting of the of the symmetry. Mm -hmm. There's one piece of that thing. Okay. The reason I'm surprised by that is because uh, this, for instance, uh, and perhaps another question that I can I can ask you is this result valid for c equal to zero? Ah. Ah. Uh, oh crap! I wrote I Z. So strictly, I'm claiming that it is. <laughs> that can be right. Okay, sorry. I think I should write I Z star here. I'm not sure what for C C equals zero is a badly singular point of this whole construction. I'm not even sure I can make sense of a finite temperature partition function in that case. Mm -hmm. So I don't dare to say anything. I, I will have to sit down and look back at what happens for C mm -hmm. equals zero. Yeah. Wait, is what is the case? Uh, what I really needed was the fact that, yeah, it, typically I need really C non-zero. B can be zero in certain cases, but C really needs to be zero. Oh, sorry, C really needs to be non-zero. OK, I don't dare to say anything mm -hmm. for, C, mm -hmm. for C being yeah. zero. Yeah. Um, the reason I was asking about that is because I think if, if you look at the metric, the C equals zero case, it seems to me, perhaps I'm wrong, but it's the one that would correspond to the to the cylinder saddle. Um, that was my intuition. Perhaps it's wrong. I don't know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the, the cylinder doesn't have a three-dimensional isometry in any case. So just, just by sort of naive counting, you know that, that that cannot, you know, the cylinder is S1 times R and the isometries are just going to be rotations around S1 and translations along R. In, in, another way to phrase it is to say that the cylinder is a quotient of the plane by an identification in one direction. The isometry group, group of the plane is the Euclidean group. So you have two translations and rotations, but this identification breaks rotations. So that's no longer an isometry. And the only isometries that survive are the two translations, one of which mm. now becomes a rotation. So it has to be a beta to the minus one in terms of counting. Yeah. Uh, I would have to look back at the metric to tell you exactly why C equals zero is not a cylinder. Off the top of my head like this, I cannot. OK. I'm not sure I can come up with it, but I would. Yeah. You know, the generic, in a sense, the cylinder is the generic situation you should expect even. Yeah. The, the, the thing that confuses me as well is that in, in JT gravity, for instance, you there is people don't compute the cylinder partition function by simply looking at the Schwarzian, right? What they have to do is to compute uh, essentially the half cylinder on one side, the half cylinder on the other, and then yes, glue them yes. together in an appropriate way. Yes. So this would be like different in that regard if you are directly constructing the cylinder partition function without any gluing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That goes back to the question of Mark early, early on in the talk. Uh, yes, that, those things I haven't I haven't tried to address. That's but in the, the cylinder would have two uh, betas. Exactly, it would have beta one and beta two. And it would you were saying it would even have different inverse temperatures. Okay, good. So that's one of the. Okay, I, th I think if we consider a half cylinder, you're also breaking the translations. You you really have only one symmetry. Even if I if I just sort of forget about what happens, why? Wait, why? Why is this the case? Uh, you mean because it's not it's not strictly an infinite cylinder, so I'm breaking the translations. Yeah, you're kidding. It's sort of like a half, half it's really a half cylinder in the literal the sense. Which is kind of, yeah, okay. Hmm. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. But I my feeling was that these asymptotic symmetries in the end cared only what, about what happens near infinity. You know, it's for example here if I have c over b, which is two i the bulk metric has a singularity at the origin at the very least but still the asymptotic symmetries think that there is a euclidean isometry of those so i feel like that's you know feels like it's fine but what, what i mean is if you take so take c over b which is 2i so now you have a twofold cover of the euclidean plane so you have for sure you're going to have a sort of a conical excess at the origin yeah and therefore the whatever your manifold is cannot possibly be invariant under all translations. That for sure is not the case. Yeah. Despite this, the sort of the asymptotic symmetries seem to see all three potential generators simply because they are you know, functions on the circle and they happen to be periodic exactly at those values of C over B, which is again similar to what happens in ADS3. In ADS3, you can have a conical axis which is quantized and have a uh, in this case, a six-dimensional isometry group, at least locally, 
even though in fact in the bulk there is a conical axis that breaks that makes makes some of those isometries uh, well that breaks some of those isometries so i think here it's similar and in that sense i would not be surprised that even the half cylinder doesn't really care about the fact that it's a half cylinder but i'm not sure you know i'm, I'm transposing some intuition from 3d gravity to 2d and it's it's dangerous so i shouldn't commit Maybe we can return to it after the official end of the yeah. talk if, if you want to discuss more. But so, because I'm really close, let me just, you know, I was so happy with my time. Let me just finish finish on time. So anyway, um, so that's the partition function. And so to conclude, um, let me just repeat once more what the BMS2 group is. In a sense, I was trying to advocate throughout this talk that even regardless of 2D gravity, just studying BMS2 invariant theories might be fun. It's an extension of the warped uh, symmetry or warped Verzoro symmetry, which you know might be of interest to, to people interested in warped Verzoro. Uh, and also, it's definitely a symmetry group to which most of the Verzoro quadrant orbits machinery applies. So if you're, you know, if you like these kinds of considerations, you might start having fun with BMS2. And also, finally, I mentioned that it has a Schwarzen-like action, although, as I pointed out, this action is pathological. In fact, there's a number of bad sides to the whole story, one of which is the fact that this uh, Q0 current is redundant. It never quite appears in the metric. So there's sort of an arbitrary constant, uh, integration constant, if you will, uh, in the definition of BMS2. It has a single real orbit, which again is sort of peculiar compared to other infinite dimensional groups. And most importantly, the Schwarzen has no saddle point. And finally, I mentioned that the complexification might change things, but it's a bit unclear because there is no well-defined complexification of DFS1. So, you know, it's not clear which is the right frame framework for addressing this. Relatedly, we also saw that the flat JT boundary action is in fact the BMS Schwarzen plus a crucial zero mode, which to begin with ensured the existence of a saddle point. And that in turn gave rise to well-defined one loop uh, partition function, although I was unable to interpret this beta not in that case as an invariant. So there's clearly, you know, this is partly a story that works, but it's also partly a story in progress in the sense that there's a lot of questions that still remain to be addressed. And I hope to have shared um, both some of the nice sides of the story with you and some of the questions that, that should be addressed. So, you know, I hope you've enjoyed it and uh, thank you very much for having me and for, for your attention. Thanks. Also, I wanted to say one thing. Thanks a lot for actually sort of, you know, it's nice to give Zoom talks or actually see the people on the screen because I've, I've given some Zoom talks where sort of everyone just disappears and you're really the only human face that you see is sort of in the upper right corner of the screen, you just see your face and it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's tough, it's very tough. So thanks for asking the questions and thanks for, for sort of showing up, it's, it's really nice. Thanks, Agoji, for a very nice talk. Um, we asked lots of questions already uh, while you were talking, but uh, if we have some additional questions. I mean, I, I do, I do have a. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm still. Uh, I guess I'm still a bit confused by the the enfold cover. Uh, yeah. So, so you, you were saying that the yeah the bulk solution has a has a singularity. Yeah, that's true. I think I think that's true. We've never yeah. we've never really considered this kind of solution with a. Arjun and Prost and Felipe. So, uh, I guess, I, I guess I, even even in in, J, in in ADS, I don't know what is the interpretation of this uh, of this object. In in JT gravity, people have computed the the dispartition function with a with a defect in the origin, right? And okay. uh, what they find is that uh, it is essentially given by the same trumpet partition function. Uh, where you have to analytically continue the, the geodesic length oh, that you have for the trumpet. Um, but this doesn't, doesn't seem to be the same case as, as what's written over here. I mean, so I, I can give the interpretation again in terms of ADS3 or even flat space in 3D. I really mean 3D bulk uh, in the sense that in that case, you can also consider conical deficits and conical excesses, which are literally given by choosing some origin in space, um, you know, sort of cutting out the circle at some point and then, well, either cutting out the circle and then going back 
or in fact cutting out and then winding a certain number of times and gluing back again. And then the total angle that you're going to uh, cover when doing one circle around the origin is not going to be two pi, but something else. And the point is that when that angle that you perform is an integer multiple of two pi, it can be two pi, but it may be four pi, six pi, eight pi, and so on. Then in fact, there's an isometry enhancement, at least in terms of asymptotic symmetries, you really see that the asymptotic symmetries have, uh, well, effect. in fact, the number of asymptotes, well, the stabilizer of that metric uh, in terms of asymptotic symmetries has the same dimension as the isometry group of the background. This is something that you know in ADS3 it's been it's been known for a while, and in this in the context of quadrant orbits, in fact, it's been used by I think Yoris Raymakers to compute some uh, one loop correction to the mass of those things. He was using explicit geometric quantization to, to sort of compute a mass shift, which was which I found very interesting uh, years ago by now. Mm -hmm. um, here, I think the intuition would be maybe, you know, when I replied that this beta to the minus one was, so that's for the beta to the minus three half. So that's for the integer case. Uh, when I replied uh, to you, Felipe, that it was a cylinder in the generic case, actually, now that I think back, you know, maybe it's just a cone. That's mm -hmm. also, you know, a conical deficit in flat space, you, could, you, you can just take a cone and that's going to be locally flat. Uh, and is going to have a conical deficit at the origin, and maybe that I, I, maybe that's actually what is better to do. Maybe, maybe that's a better answer than saying it's a cylinder. Mm -hmm. Except my problem with the cone is that then the isometries, right? Yeah, I mean, the quantity of isometry somehow doesn't seem to match because I would have expected it to have a better to the minus one half. Yeah, and that's that's what happens in in the JT gravity case when you consider a, a disk with one defect in the in the center. If I remember correctly, right, better to the minus one half. Yes, exactly. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm confused by this uh, generic B and C case. I don't know. I'm I'm not sure what's the geometry, the saddle. Okay, 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 okay. Good point. That's actually easy to address. I should just take take a look back at the metric and just tell you what it is. So off the top of my head, like this, I cannot do it, but I I'll take a look and I can I can actually let me write down because we haven't we still haven't uploaded the V two of the paper and there's a number of things that they would like to sort of add, and so this this may be one of them. So thanks, it's a good comment. I didn't find well, okay. Okay, um, if there are no additional questions, let's thanks Apoji one more time. Thanks guys. Let me stop sharing actually, I don't have to share anymore, okay. And I stopped the recording, I think, no.